Steelers channel tonight. Live and always joining me tonight is Jason Laufenberg of Awake Souls and special guest, the one and only Zen Garcia. How's it going tonight, brothers? I'm doing well. How are you, Zen? Most excellent. Glad to be here with you guys and um, glad to, you know, have this opportunity. Cool. So go ahead, Jason. I'm sorry. Ronnie, Ronnie is generally, um, you know, the lead on, on Sunday nights because we try to, you know, Wednesdays are more of our techie stuff. Fridays, we sort of talk about what's going on in the community and Sundays, we like to keep uh, scriptural, and um, right on. I've I've mentioned it before that uh, Ronnie had been researching the extra canonical scriptures long before I even knew that they existed, and um, he cited you as a source many times for for his research on that, and he he thinks of you in high regards and. So we think of you as a, a researcher on this topic and would love to hear you know, your input on, uh, on some of these topics. And we're a special group too, because there's you know, not a whole lot of people on the earth that know the earth is flat. So right. we, we've really been singled out in a special way. Yeah, I agree. And um, yes, the study of the ancient manuscripts, the extra biblical ma materials has been a focus of my life for several decades now and i do specialize in that area and uh, we are also a publishing company sacredwordpublishing.com and so we do help to compile uh, these different manuscripts to put them together in collections so that people can also become familiar with and get to know and have available all of these lost, forgotten, and forbidden texts. And in that way, in my opinion, in studying them and examining them thoroughly, uh, people become familiar with topics that otherwise may remain ambiguous, just reading only the canonical, the authorized, the King James uh, version of the Bible. And also, um, another thing that we do is we have a every Saturday weekly study on the Targum where we go chapter by chapter and verse by verse through what is the Aramaic Targum, Targum meaning translation. It is the oldest rendition of the Hebrew Torah into Aramaic, and it is the first translation and first authorized translation of the Hebrew Torah into a different language. And it came about because of the diaspora of the Israelites into Babylon, that for the 70 years that they were there during the period of Jeremiah, Nehemiah, Ezra, and Daniel the prophet, that they assimilated Aramaic as the predominant lexicon of that era and that, um, area uh, as far as the Middle East. And so when they were released from the captivity and that 70 years of banishment and exile abroad, returning back to the Holy Land and rebuilding the temple, um, they found that Hebrew was predominantly a scholarly language and it was kind of lost to the lay people and so when worship was reinstituted, uh, the, the, the rabbis and the priestly class would always have to stop and translate the Hebrew Torah into Aramaic. And so that's when this translation was authorized and came into being around 4 BC. And uh, it's older than the Greek Septuagint, even uh, the first translations of the Aramaic Targum, and it is the version that the Israelites themselves used. And in studying and reading from the Targum, people become very familiar with a lot of things that have been lost in translation. And there's so much material that is uh, excluded and things that have been 
change that when you read the, the Targum versions, you learn so much more about the heritage and the, the traditions of our, our ancient past. Things that have become lost and unfamiliar to the mainstream, the majority opinion. Yeah, well, you can find in some of the translations that we have now, there'll be, you know, the Arabic gospel or the infancy gospel according to the Arabic text. And there's an overlying Aramaic, Arabic, and then the roots back to Hebrew. I've done a bit of research on that myself. You know, we use the name Yahweh and Yahushai for the YHWH. Um, and yeah, like Jason was saying, your studies, they've, they've been great. And, you know, that brings me to my, one of the topics that I want to discuss tonight is, um, you know, I know that we're all out here. Jason and I are two, two people that, that don't shy away from calling attention to um, topics that need to be discussed. Um, I keep seeing shots being taken at you by um, Dean O'Dell. Um, and uh, you've, I've, I've seen you on stage with him. You know, those would have probably been the best times for him to discuss situations with you. So, you know, an accusation that I heard that I wanted to ask you about um, do you believe that we're all fallen angels trying to somehow work out redemption? Well, there's, as far as the fallen angels, no. And I've explained this to him as well. Mm -hmm. I do believe, yes, we pre-existed and that we were angelic, bright-natured um, beings previous to our taking uh, f flesh embodiment. But as far as the fallen angels, Legion, and the rebel angels, which rebelled against the Most High God, and that are in you know the forces of wickedness, the rulers of, of darkness, the principalities and powers that are aligned against the Most High God, no, uh, I don't believe that at all. Okay. And I believe that the fallen angels are excluded from salvation and that they do not take human embodiment in the manner that they are born into flesh form, but that they possess people that through ritual give themselves up to such possession. And so mm -hmm. there is a very big difference with regard to uh, those two premises. Well, you said it exactly the way that, you know, I had heard. So basically what Dean is doing is, and again, this is an invitation to Dean and everybody else. All we ever want to do is to have open discourse. And when we have issues that we want to discuss, I feel that we need to discuss them like men and um, absolutely. And children of the most high. I'm sure that, you know, we're going to all. So I know from my research and I've been listening to you for 10 years, right. About, um, and you know, I learned a lot about the pre pre existence from you, from the scriptures that you're reading. So um, there was an issue in heaven right and um there was a this reality was created and we we are here separate from the creator to make a choice correct yes absolutely and that's what i i pretty much learned from you um so i guess the straw man that you know he's trying to just tie you to this whole fallen angels thing which you know in a way that's who we're at war with. So, you know, having a, a tag like fallen angels is great. It's like info wars is another great tag. Um, okay. So the next thing is the whole Sophia talk. Um, we discussed this and I remember coming out of the, the hangout thinking that, you know, you made some really valid points with the translations and with the, um, the feminine aspect it, it is um, do with she cry not at the gates and wisdom is referred to in the Psalms as a feminine spirit. Um, and I, we know that it's his spirit, but we don't, I don't, I think that when we get stuck in an earthly understanding of something, we, we try to make it physical into our so-called reality. And um, you know, that's, you're a blasphemer of the Holy spirit apparently. And you know, what, what do you say to that? Well, I, you know, I've reached out and talked to because Dean and I were friends at one time. Uh, and I told him I would have no problem with either coming on to his show or he could come on to mine or we could meet in middle ground and come on to somebody else's show, um, you know, and discuss these things and go through it chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And I would have no problem at all showing that 
absolutely in the scriptures and also in the the language before the Greek translations that in the Aramaic and the uh, Jewish, the Hebrew language, the Holy Spirit is regarded as feminine in aspect. And that it is also, she also reveals herself in the Proverbs and in other places, uh, especially in the Apocrypha. And even Christ himself refers to uh, the Holy Spirit in the feminine. And so right there in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, you see that man is created in the image of the Holy Trinity, male and female created he them. And so, you know, it, where is and who is the feminine aspect uh, if it's not the Holy Spirit? What is it alluding to? And where does it come from? And with regard to the physical and the physical aspect, and, and you know, as far as we understand male and female according to uh, genitalia and to human procreative, um, as far as you know, the, the whole procreative process that children are born of women and male, you know, we do. Um, we provide the sperm that joins with the egg and that creates the physical and that that is the vehicle for the spirit to enter into. But even in Jeremiah, you know, it, it shows to us and Christ said, the word of the Lord goes to Jeremiah and tells him, you know, I have known you before you ever entered into the womb of your mother I had foreordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. And looking up all those words in the Hebrew, it becomes very clear that Christ is telling them, and it says this all throughout the scriptures as well, that he knew us before the foundations of the world even, meaning that our spirits were known to him and by him, and they preexisted even before this world was created. And so all of those things become very clear when you study them in great aspect, and especially in the, uh, the rabbinical commentaries, the legends of the Jews, the traditions of the Jews, uh, the old, you know, the ancient uh, sources that were written by the Israelites themselves, the commentary on their own scriptures, all of that becomes very clear. And I cite all of those sources and share with them, uh, with others, so that people can understand better that most certainly, yes, um, in the, in, and with regard to Sophia, Sophia is just the Greek translation of our English word wisdom. And it's the Hebrew word shokma. And so in, the, in a lot of the Nakamati codices, as well, there's a reference for Sophia in those where they're speaking about the fall of the Holy Spirit and, and being part responsible for the creation of these visible worlds. But all of that was according to God's, um, you know, the, the whole purpose for establishing and creating redemption. Because it talks about this also in the legends of the Jews and the first chapters that uh, God held counsel with the Torah. Uh, she, uh, meaning wisdom and also the Holy Spirit and the, the spirit of prophecy that we see in Genesis chapter 1 in the first few verses that uh, she is the spirit of God that hovers above the waters and above darkness. And that Christ, then the only begotten son, is called forth by the Father and comes forth as the light of the world. And so you see the, you know, the Trinity reference in the first three verses of Genesis. And it's because it is the Trinity, the triune Godhead that is responsible for creating and manifesting the entirety of all things visible and well, unseen. Yeah, we completely... Um agree with with most of what you're saying there um i i know i do i'm not going to speak completely for jason but i can also add to it there is um <clears throat> the shepherd of hermes oh yes. go ahead Jay. Mm -hmm. 
I, I would just wanted to add to it um, that I I totally agree with what you're saying there. Um, that that totally coincides with everything that I've been learning all the way along. And uh, if you could help us, when you say that you you're able to quote from from your knowledge so well, but could you slow down and help the audience with two, <laughs> yeah, some sure. of those citations? so that they can test and verify this for themselves this we're we're always going down to we're going to go to the word we're going to in, instead of just a summary and i don't disagree with your summary but um more citation if you could yeah sure um well let's uh you know if you go to first in the proverbs and the entire chapter of the Proverbs is revealing and speaking about uh, the Holy Spirit as being uh, the basically the perfect spouse of the Most High God. And it also reveals how a woman that falls away and becomes a, a harlot, like, you know, in Israel, as the people did, um, that she is the bride of Christ and he, that he is the bridegroom and that we see depicted throughout the scriptures that Israel is referenced in manner as being the bride of Christ and the church is the bride of Christ as well. But in, for instance, um, in Proverbs chapter eight, you see, it says, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there when he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delight were with the sons of men. It, you can read in several different places all throughout the Proverbs that the Holy Spirit, shown here as pre existent with the Most High God, the Father uh, Yahweh, and also the Son uh, Yahushua. And so we see that um, the triune because it says also in John that there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so this is where people can go to better understand this teaching. You can go to, you know, Proverbs, and in several places, it references her as in feminine aspect. Mm -hmm. And then also all throughout the Apocrypha text, and I'll share a few uh, verses, but all throughout the Apocrypha. And what people have to understand as well is that the Old Testament and also that the Apocrypha used to be part of the original 80 book canon of the mm -hmm. King James Version of the Bible. The Lost the, Books, right? Yeah, the Lost Books. The We're reading those books. currently, actually. We're yeah, through they're, they're most excellent texts, but they are specific to revealing uh, the, the Holy Spirit as being the aspect, the feminine aspect of the Godhead. And the Old Testament is about the Father, mm -hmm. Yahweh, and then the New Testament is about the Son. But you put the Apocrypha together with all that, and you'll see that she is defined in, in great detail in the Apocrypha as being, again, the feminine aspect of the Godhead. And so I'll share a couple things here. Um, in, in 
in Luke chapter 7, verse 35, it says, but wisdom is justified of all her children. And that is Christ that is referencing her, the wisdom, as being the feminine aspect of the Godhead. In Proverbs chapter 1, it says, wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse. In the opening of the gates in the city, she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. In Proverbs chapter 3, which also speaks of her being part of establishing the creation, it says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand, riches and honor her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace she is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retaineth her the lord by wisdom hath founded the earth by understanding hath he established the heavens and so there again you just see that the Lord by wisdom, which is the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit was part uh, in helping and aiding the Father to create and establish the earth and also the heavens, which that's Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In uh, ver chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath honed out her seven pillars. And, you know, I'll go to a couple of passages from the apocryphal text to also reaffirm this whole precept, this whole premise. In the wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach, chapter one, it says, all wisdom cometh from the Lord and is with him forever. Who can number the sand of the sea? and the drops of rain and the days of eternity? Who can find out the height of heaven and the breadth of the earth and the deep and wisdom? Wisdom hath been created before all things and the understanding of prudence from everlasting. The word of God most high is the fountain of wisdom and her ways are everlasting commandments. To whom hath the root of wisdom been revealed, or who hath known her wise counsels? Unto whom hath the knowledge of wisdom been made manifest, and who hath understood her great experience? There is one wise and greatly to be feared, the Lord sitting upon his throne. He created her and saw her and numbered her and poured her out upon all his works. She is with all flesh according to his gift, and he hath given her to them that love him. She hath built an everlasting foundation with men, and she shall continue with their seed. To fear the Lord is fullness of wisdom, and filleth men with her fruits. She filleth all their house, with things desirable and the garners with her increase. And so this passage is basically telling us that wisdom, the Holy Spirit, is the nefesh, the breath of life that indwells our flesh bodies. And that is the, the breath of life, the spirit, which gives our bodies consciousness, our touch, warmth our breath, you know, the, the warmth as well. And so, you know, again, she is our nefesh, our spirits that indwell our bodies. 
Um, a couple other passages, and then I'll get you to comment. Second Ezra, chapter 13, verse 55, it says, Thy life has thou ordered in wisdom, and hast called understanding thy mother. The wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach, verse 26, chapter 1. If thou desire wisdom, keep the commandments, and the Lord shall give her unto thee. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 6. And I would recommend that if people want to really know uh, about wisdom, the Holy Spirit, and her being defined in great capacity, that to read the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 6 through chapter 13. And it gives you the most elaborate and great detail of wisdom and also of the Holy Spirit's presence and her responsibility in being involved in so many things, even that she was the pillar of light that led Israel through the Exodus and uh, in imparting the, the Red Sea as well. Uh, so all of those things are found within those chapters as well. But I'll read this short passage from the Wisdom of Solomon. It says, as for wisdom, what she is and how she came up, I will tell you and will not hide mysteries from you, but will seek her out from the beginning of her nativity and bring the knowledge of her into light and will not pass over the truth. And so when you read, you know, as I said, all of these passages uh, and all of these verses, especially in the Apocrypha, uh, but, you know, even in the King James version of the canon, uh, minus the Apocrypha that you find in Proverbs in other places that the Holy Spirit is defined as the feminine aspect of the Godhead, which again makes sense when you look at Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 28, where it speaks about um, man being created in the image of the Holy Trinity, male and female created them, you know, us. So, I mean, it's absolutely clear in my opinion. Well, we're also referred to as the bride, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's no Christian can really say that that's not what it says in the, in the new script, in the new Testament. And, you know, the father, um, the first dispensation, you know, you shy as a human, the father, as a, as a man, and the second dispensation, the word of God. And then the third would be the Apocrypha, which would be the Holy spirit put back into the, into the, that's what we're in right now. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I truly feel that, you know, you've done a good job and there's, there's even more references to it being a type of a feminine thing as well. When Yahushai came back from, from the grave, the first, the first people that he witnessed to were women. Right. So right. Um, I kind of understand why you're, you're getting picked on so much because, you know, this is, is knowledgeable stuff. It's wisdom from the, the beginning of the foundations of creation of, of course, the Jesuits and free, Freemasons are going to try to stop you. Um, so the other issues that I had was um, with the serpent seed line. Um, I know it's not you, but um, Jonathan Clegg teaches that they were like confunctious twins. But when I sourced the um, the Cave of Treasures and the first book of Adam and Eve, they both tell us that Cain was born with his twin sister La Bahuda, and Eve er, and Abel was brought forth with his twin sister right yes, kill a math man. right so and, and then it's also referenced here in the other scriptures so cain and abel weren't like cain wasn't so are you saying that cain as well as his twin sister were both seed from 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 satan's well uh, of course it all goes back to what story you are going to reference and my my thing is, is I stick with first as foundation, what is revealed in the canonical materials. And the reason being is because I know that according to the work of Ivan Panin and also uh, my friend, Bill McGregor, who just recently released the tuning fork and shows how the 66 books of um, the Bible are also divinely inspired and revealed in the 66 chapters of Isaiah. 
and that the equal distance letter sequencing, the Bible codes are also found and based upon the canonical material. So I accept the canon as my foundation for truth. And in the canon, as well as in the Targum, it's my opinion that it is referenced that Cain and Abel are twins. And I do know, because I do study all of the other texts, that it cites them as being twins, but with a, a twin sister, and that they were separated in age, that, um, that Cain was 17 and Abel 13 when they were born with their twin sisters. But in my opinion, when you look at the Targum, as well as the... Um, in the the King James you see or it is alluded to that they were twins uh, for instance in the Targum version of Genesis chapter 4 and 1 it says and Adam knew Hava his wife who had desired the angel and she conceived and bare Cain and she said I have acquired a man the angel of the Lord and she added to bear which meaning she continued in labor from her husband adam his twin even abel and so in the targum and also in the king james it seems to allude that they were twins and that she continued to bear meaning that she continued in labor and whether the twin sisters are excluded and she actually gave birth to quadru you know quadru quadruplets we don't know it doesn't reference the girls in these particular verses but it does seem to allude to Cain and Abel as being twins and we know that certainly um, that they are the fulfillment of the Genesis 315 the prophecy which the most high said to the serpent i will put enmity between thy seed and her seed and that christ would be the fulfillment of the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent and that um you know it would be goliath that would be nipping at his heel for those that don't, don't understand that prophecy i can explain it as well but in you know um looking at the Targum versions of these particular verses, even in Genesis 3.15, you find something of great interest that says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between the seed of thy son and the seed of her son. We know that the seed of thy son, speaking to the serpent, that that was Cain. And the reason that it mentions, and the seed of her sons in the very next verse, is because Cain was murdered by his half-brother. I mean, Abel was murdered by his half-brother Cain. And Seth, uh, Sheth in the Hebrew, was born as a replacement. That his name even means substitution, replacement, and compensation. Well, but see, well, I, I do understand your, your studies. And like I said before, I've got three different separate texts here that speak to um adam and eve were both being virgins after coming out of the garden um and it says redundantly not redundantly that's the wrong word it says um and gives witness to the fact that the the main issue was that satan had whispered in cain's ear so in my opinion this is just what what i've learned from my scripture study and everybody you're free to I really hope that you'll follow out exactly what Zen is saying, follow out what I say and do your own, like ask the Holy Spirit to speak through you and teach you. Um, I find that, you know, Cain was, Cain was overtaken by a spirit, spirit of jealousy and of, of envy and hatred. And, and he slew his brother because of that lust for his twin sister, because he thought she was more fair. And um so my question is then, this is just what I believe. So I believe that the serpent seed, it, it is a plausibility, but I think it's of a spiritual reference because after the flood, could you explain to me how any of Cain's line made it? Yeah, absolutely. I can explain that in, in great detail. Um, but let me first say that um, 
it it's not just of a spiritual nature but that it was physical and that he is the seed of the serpent he was the progenitor of the cain line and that the line of cain are declared by yahushua in the new testament as being the murderers of the prophets and he links the pharisees to killing zacharias the father of john the baptist and he says that they and their fathers and their bloodline are the murderers of the prophets from Zacharias uh, to Abel. And Cain was the murderer of Abel. And we see in Matthew chapter 13. Well, Cain, Cain would be the father of, of, of lies and the, th the father of murder, not, not anything in spiritual. He was literally the flesh, I don't know if the progenitor, the, the leader of that group, right? Yeah, he was the, the 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 person that started that lineage, and we see that his bloodline is separated from the children of Adam. They're listed in Genesis chapter four, and Adam's yeah, but, children are listed in Genesis chapter five. Because we get the we get the we get from the sixty six book that Cain's uh, offering was not accepted, and Abel's was, and that's why when I go back to the. Uh, the cave of treasures in the first book of Adam and Eve, I really find more foundation in understanding that it was Cain's jealousy, right? The father of all wickedness and killing and, and, and all that would come out of that strife rather than me to believe because it keeps referencing that Adam, Adam, the first priest and Cain and Abel, his sons. Um, and, you know, there is multiple times that this is just what my research has shown that you know, and, and I can understand how you can have, let's say, seven different kinds of foxes and you could have, you know, multiple different colors and you could have, you know, you only need. And I understand how these children were brought out. I just really don't think that uh, my other question was, yeah, because um, I know there was giants after the flood, correct? Yeah, there were. Because Joshua, when he entered into the promised land and slew the Amorites and the Malachi, you know, how he excluded all those places and they were like monsters, weren't they like vampires and giants? And this was after the flood, right? Where did these people come from? All right. Well, let's go back because you're skipping over and let's establish the whole thing with Cain first, because there's a reason why he was inclined to evil. And that's because he was a physical progeny of the devil. And you see that in first John chapter three, verse 12 where it says Cain who was of that wicked one whether you think that was physical or not it's very clear throughout the scriptures that he was the physical bloodline of the devil that word of there in that verse means son of child of and progeny of the wicked one and then again in Matthew chapter 13 we see that Christ very clearly states that the tares are the children of the enemy and that the enemy snuck into the garden, sowed the tares and that the enemy is the devil, the wicked one. It's very clear. It says it but multiple times. That doesn't times. sound like he came in through the front door. It says he snuck in and sowed the tares. So I, I still believe that it's, but see the, the problem that I get stuck on with my, my understanding um, is there's always an earthly understanding as well as a heavenly. There's a physical and a spiritual. And that's, I can't understand how the, because Cain's line ends. It doesn't end. It's still with us today. The elites of the world and all those that are sitting on the thrones of the world are of the line. So was of it Cain. Ham? Was it, was it one of it the wives? And I will get to that, but let's okay. talk about this first. Uh, Again, reading from many different sources, it becomes clear that Cain was the physical progeny of the devil. And I'll share a couple of verses here from the legends of the Jews and also the traditions of the Jews. It says, and Adam knew his wife who had conceived by the angel Samael was pregnant and bare Cain, whose resemblance was like the upper creatures and not like the lower and she said, I have gotten a man from the angel of the Lord. And so, again, it's very clear here that Cain was born from the angel Samael, which is the same as Satan, the serpent in the garden, that it was her beguilement 
by the serpent, which led to the conception of Cain, and that he was different. He had a seraphic appearance, which is, we'll get this from the legends of the Jews. It says, Cain's descent from Satan, who is the angel Samael, was revealed in his seraphic appearance. At his birth, the exclamation was wrung from me, I have gotten a man through an angel of the Lord. And so that passage, the second portion, where it says I received a man from the angel of the Lord, that's exactly what happened. She got Cain from the beguilement of Samael, that that angel of the Lord is where she got Cain as the man from the angel of the Lord. So that passage doesn't make sense in the King James unless you understand, as it says in the Targum, that it was her desiring the angel which led to the conception of Cain. And so he very most certainly was the physical progeny of the devil. And there's many verses which clarify that. I'll read one more, but, you know, there's... Because the original, the original sin that I found in the, the book of Adam and Eve is that the serpent disguised himself like Eve, right? So that it was a comely, she thought she was almost looking into a mirror and that's how she was beguiled. She was tricked by the femininity of the, the image that Satan projected as himself. And then he said, no, you surely won't die. You can eat of this fruit. You will become like God, right? That's what I always thought. Well, that that's one story in many. But again, when you consider all of these other passages and all of these other verses, it becomes clear that she was physically, sexually seduced by the serpent and impregnated with Cain. Otherwise, how would the punishments even make sense? Then it, her eating an apple is what led to her then giving uh, birth to children in sorrow and that there would be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. But that's not the way that the story goes, that the cave of that treasures. That is the way that the story goes. It says that they, they came out of virgins and then they were tempted over and over again. And then it was finally when they got the blessing of the creator that they actually became husband and wife, Adam and Eve. They were, they were still um, more like brother and sister in the beginning um, from the books that I've read. But it, see, this is where the contradiction comes in. And what you're telling me is I, I need to read. There was two books you keep, the Targum. And the other one is the, the, the writings of the Jews. No, I'm not just talking about those, but you can just look at the story in the King James, mm -hmm. just right there in Genesis chapter three, they're eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That when you look at Genesis chapter two, verse 28, it says that they were naked and they were not ashamed. And then we have the seduction, the beguilement happening in Genesis chapter three, where she eats fruit from the tree of knowledge, good and evil, and then she gives to her husband as well. And then what do they do? They sew fig leaves to cover up their genitals, and then they try to hide from the Most High God. So that's where the sexual seduction takes place. If you look at Second Corinthians, I mean, uh, uh, Second Corinthians chapter eleven, Paul references in those verses that. Eve, it was her sexual seduction, becoming holy, beguilement, wholly seduced by the serpent that led to her not being a chaste virgin. The only way a woman is not a chaste virgin is if she is sexually corrupted physically, and that's how she lost her virginity. And so, again, looking at just the story in the King James, when you understand this in different contexts, it becomes clear that the punishments that resulted from them eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that Eve was sexually seduced by the serpent and impregnated with Cain. And that's why the Most High God, in his punishments, there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, 16, and 17, he turns to the serpent and says, because you've done this, not only am I going to put you on your belly, but I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. 
So he sees that she is already pregnant with both Cain uh, and also Abel because Adam's eating the fruit was her his repeating the act that he saw the serpent and Eve committing. And so that's why they were punished in the manner that they were. And those were prophecies. God already foresaw that Eve was pregnant. That's why they covered their genitals and they tried to hide from him. They knew they had done something uh, wrong. And so, you know, again, an apple does not lead to Eve being pregnant and then bringing forth children in sorrow. And then Adam having to work the soil uh, to provide sustenance to feed his future progeny. And again, it, this becomes very clear in many different verses and many different chapters. As I said, um, and I'll share another one from Genesis chapter 5 from the Targum version. And yeah, there's many different books you need to read to get clarity because right now you're misunderstanding the whole story of what happened in the garden. In Genesis chapter 5, it says, man in the day they were created and Adam lived 130 years and begat Sheth, who had the likeness of his image and of his similitude. For before had Hava born Cain, who was not like him, and Abel was killed by his hand, and Cain was cast out. Neither is his seed genealized in the book of the genealogy of Adam. But afterwards there was born one like him, and he called his name Sheth, which again, Sheth means replacement, substitution, compensation. Cain's name in the Hebrew, Cain, means acquired, possession, as if you acquire a stepson, which is exactly what he was. He was uh, Adam's stepson. And when you look at, you know, there's several different places where it makes mention of Cain not being in the similitude or the likeness of Adam, that he had a seraphic appearance, that he looked like a serpent, that he took on the, uh, the visage of a viper. And so that's why Christ also references his bloodline as being a den of vipers. And they are mentioned, you know, and the serpent is mentioned as being a dragon. In the Kebra Nagas, it says, And he drove him out of the garden because of his apostasy through the sin of the serpent and the plotting of the devil. And at that sorrowful moment, Cain was born and when Adam saw that the face of Cain was ill-tempered or sullen and his appearance evil, he was sad. And then Abel was born. And when Adam saw that his appearance was good and his face good-tempered, he said, this is my son, the heir of my kingdom. And so we see in many different places that Cain was not like Adam. And then when Seth is born, he is said to be in the similitude and the likeness of Adam because he is the second born son of Adam. And we get clarity on this in the book of Jubilees. It tells us that Seth was the second born of Adam. It says, and Adam and his wife mourned for Abel four weeks of years. And in the fourth year of the fifth week, they became joyful. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare him a son, and he called his name Seth, for he said, God hath raised us up a second seed unto us on the earth instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. And so we see that Seth is the second born son of Adam and Eve, whereas if Cain was their child, that would Seth would be their third born son. And we get confirmation of this also in the genealogy of Christ. When you look at Luke chapter 3, and also the genealogy of Christ is listed in the book of the bee and the cave of the treasures, but that the, Cain is excluded from that genealogy. But in, in the book of the bee and the cave of the treasures, it explicitly states that 
Cain was born with his twin sister, Labuhuda, and Eve and Abel was born with his twin sister, Kilamath. And I'm saying the replacement was correct. That was Seth. I agree with you. He was a replacement for Abel, right? But so what I'm picking up here is that you have some really valid arguments and and um, I appreciate you sharing all these scriptures, but we do have a conflict. And so we as researchers got to stop and figure out why a conflict like this would exist. Now, this whole topic, I mean, it's not a salvation topic. So it's, it's not one to like lose your mind over, um, <clears throat> but it is interesting. And we are encouraged to do our, our best to seek truth always. And, um, you know, we, we try to do it in everything. So um, what, what do you think, Zen, would be the reason why we would have this type of conflict? Because you do have a valid argument. Well, the conflict is, is because most people don't understand what actually occurred in the garden. And it's because, you know, they, again, they try to um, say that the Adam and Eve eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that that was just an apple when again it becomes very clear when you study the hebrew and you look at the context of what is being revealed that absolutely it's only by understanding that the story plays out in sexual manner that even the punishments make sense i mean it's no denying you look at the hebrew the word for eat is the word akal and it means can to lay with or enjoy something as good fortune, sexual pleasures, or the fruit of good or evil actions. The word for fruit is perrier, and it means offspring, children, progeny. Well, see, the, the, the evil actions I agree with. That's what Cain was the father of. He was the one who had that first evil spitefulness against his brother, right? That's, see, this is the only, that's where I'm, I agree with you completely that Cain well, was I, the father I, of the earthly the devil yeah, right? again the, whether you agree with me on that or not i'm telling you it was physical and he was the physical progeny of the devil and when you look at all of these sources and the references and even the hebrew words that becomes clear you may not have made that leap yet but it's absolutely clear and when you understand it that way then you can understand all of the the, because Christ said in Matthew 13 that this war between the bloodlines would be ongoing until the end of the age. And we'll go into how it was that they made it through the flood. But he says, let the wheat and the tares grow together mm -hmm. until the time of the that, end. That's exactly what my point is, is that um, how do you differentiate the two? It's not by blood. It's by your actions, your fruits. It's more of a spiritual thing. That's no, it's both. It's both. Usually there is an earthly understanding. It's the only problem is I have three other books that are standing. I'm in okay. Well, I've got, I'm, cur well, I'm curious how they made it past the flood. That's the interesting part to me. Yeah. We'll get yeah. to that first, but if we're going to talk about, if you are wanting to talk about the serpent sea, we got to settle the premise here as to, Cain being uh because you can't understand all the rest of it unless you understand that he was the physical progeny of the devil and so i'm giving you all these references so you can make that leap and I'm again looking at the hebrew and if you really want to examine this topic in fullness then we've got to go through these steps yep. because it's only by doing this that your listening audience and Others that are interested in this topic will be able to bridge the gap. So let's take the time to do it correctly. Beguiled is the word nasha. It means to delude or morally and to seduce, beguile, deceive sexually and seductively. The word enmity, you know, extreme hostility that would play out between the seed lines. Even the word seed, zera, means plant, sowing time, posterity, carnally, children, offspring, descendant, uh, children, semen, virile. Uh, all these things are, again, alluding to progeny, descendants, children. We see even the woman 
uh, the word for woman is Shah, that it has a connotation of adulteress. And so these kind of things in the Hebrew, looking at the punishments for Eve, that she would bring forth children in sorrow. The word there is yalad. It means to bear young, to show lineage, to bring forth, beget children, uh, bring young, uh, burn, uh, bring up children, deliver children, time of delivery. Uh, all these things conceived as the, the word hara. It means become pregnant conceive, to be with child, uh, progenitor, contrive, gotten uh, is the word kana. It means to create by extension, to procure, especially uh, self-implication, to attain children. All these, um, you know, by, possess. Uh, and then let's look at one other thing, then we'll go into the story of the flood. When you look in Isaiah chapter 14, we see the same thing that Christ speaks about in Matthew chapter 13. It tells us that in this story, this is about the fall of Lucifer. It says that, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? But skipping down to verse um, 19, it says, but thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. Looking up those words in the Hebrew, we see that it means the branch is netzer, and it means like the human family tree, that Lucifer here has his own bloodline, and that his children are cited here as being the seed of evildoers. The synagogue of Satan, right? The synagogue of Satan, yes. But here, um, yeah, let me sip that. One second. Yeah, I'm with you so far. I'm with you. All right. Well, we're going to establish this in greater detail. All right. So then you have going down to verse 20, it says, Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers that they do not rise nor possess the land nor fill the face of the world with cities. So this same thing is spoken about in Matthew and the Parables in Matthew are absolutely very important. Um, I told you that in John chapter 1, verse 3, I mean, chapter 3, verse 12, that where it says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, that word of there in the Greek is the word 1537. And it means the a son of offspring of child or descendant of. And so it's literally telling us but, that Cain was of the wicked one. But, you know, the thing that I remember as well is um, when he's arguing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he says to them that, that Yahweh could bring up seed from a rock from Abraham. So, again, I still believe, like, we are grafted into the family tree of Yahweh as, as Gentiles, as Goyim. Um, I think it's our deeds. It's our emotional, spiritual actions that we then choose whether to follow the father of lies, the wicked one, the serpent seed, or, or if we follow the righteous path and the sons of Seth. And, you know, and that's, I'm still hearing you explaining exactly what I, I, I follow. I'm with you all the way. The only issue is when I find my the the sexual part is where it seems like the Talmud or the tradition, the oral traditions have, in my opinion, almost perverted um, something that was pure in in a form. That's the only contention that I have. But I'll let you continue because I I do completely follow with what you're saying. There is definitely two paths that have been laid out here. There's a wicked one and there's a righteous one, and I'm I'm following you that far. Well, bringing up the Talmud, I mean, a lot of people do that to try to discredit this teaching. But 
I hadn't mentioned anything of the Talmud. No, even I, I though... was bringing because that's well. I, I know you hadn't. I'm not. That wasn't a straw man against your argument. I was just simply making a reference to it because I know that there is some perversion from that book. Uh, I can't quote you the verse, but I, I have heard the perversion that matches the story now whether you've got the proof to prove that they were taking that from the truth that's what we're here to learn right that wasn't that wasn't a straw man sorry well that's what i'm saying is that even though uh yeah the talmud does mention that the cain was also a child of the devil but so does the king james the targum and all of these other verses and that even christ tells us the same thing you know again we'll go into the story of matthew chapter 13 because it's very clear from his own words. He tells us, um, the, another parable put he forth, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up, meaning when the children were born and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servant of the householders came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And so here he tells us an enemy hath done this. An enemy is responsible for sowing the tares. Then we go to where he explains clearly to the apostles, because they ask him, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answers them directly. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. So, I mean, it doesn't so that- get any clearer than that well well, that exactly but that to me i'm sorry to interrupt you completely you're taking a spiritual parable and you're trying to make it an earthly understanding to me the heavenly understanding there is that our spirits are what choose whether we take uh the path of the 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 good soil in the field or if we you know take the withered up quick path the the because it seems like if for Satan to be the father of all of these bad people, it has to be on a supernatural spiritual level than it does. Because if Cain was the father, <laughs> you you need to look up these words in the Hebrew and the Greek, because they uh, specifically mean that he is the father of the tares, meaning that he sowed them through physical well, sexual seduction. You're trying to turn something that is physical but, well, and I have, making it only spiritual. The book of... And again, it's very clear. Okay, the yeah, the book of Adam and Eve, the cave of treasure. But it specifically I'm, states oh, that he came in through the... He came in through the seduction of, of Cain, you know, telling him, no, that, you know, well, they're, they're keeping your twin away from you. There's a clear, okay. way, there's a clear way to clear this up, and we need to get... Uh, we need to get this physical bloodline past the flood how do we do that yeah we'll get to that but we're not ready for that yet because you're still not understanding this story so let's take more verses and look at it in in greater detail because i'm going to give you hundreds of sources if you need in order to understand this story in greater clarity but again looking at it very clearly right here christ tells us that the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The tares are the children of the wicked one, the physical children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Here, he, again, alluding to the enemy that snuck into the garden, he tells you that that is the devil. 
uh, the harvest is the end of the world. And then he goes down and repeats it in verse 47. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good and the vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. But People there, can, there it didn't say because of a bloodline. It said, you know, it's implying due to our deeds, the righteous will be kept and the, the wicked deeds will be cast into the lake of fire, right? Is that what it's? No, it's referring to physical progeny. When you look up the word for seed in the Greek, it's sperma. It means seed, including the male sperm by implication, offspring especially but, a but then you're saying the, the Yahweh Shai sprayed a seed into the field no the the seed is the spiritual plant that's been put inside of us that's the way i see it i don't i don't now, see adam how... was created in god's image he is the son of god it says it in luke chapter 3 when you look at the lineage of christ it says that adam was the son of god and then Cain is excluded from that bloodline. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to Seth. But because of his is, deeds, though, not no, because of not his bloodline just, lineage. Again, this isn't just deeds. This is also has to do with physical and has to do with there being a physical bloodline that the enemy, the serpent, has his own physical bloodline. Why would it say that I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed, the seed of the serpent. And where does the seed of the serpent come from? It obviously comes from uh, her eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it's cited right there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, after she eats this fruit that God tells them after they hide their genitals with the fig leaves and try to hide from him that she's going to then give birth to children in sorrow and there's going to be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent well the, obvious. The, one interesting thing that i can bring up as I, i'm taking in what you're saying is the fact that the way that the creator was born into this world um specifically wasn't through uh you know joseph so yeah i know that th th but adam was created by god in his image yeah, yes so what i'm thinking maybe is that so all of mankind i'm still thinking that the the bloodline is throughout everybody and it's our choice i don't know if we're born into it i i'm like i said i'm i'm taking it all in i'm i'm calm down i'm thinking about everything that you're saying I'm, i appreciate your your patience here um this is a, a really tough lesson to learn and i'm enjoying it very much i'm just going to keep myself calm and just what i'm trying to see in my mind here is because if Yahushai wasn't born through a man, the Holy Spirit was the one that came upon Mary. Um, he specifically was kept out of that seed line. So, you know, there is a different, there is a delin, there's a difference there. I can see that very clearly. Well, I, I, I totally see what Zen is saying and I'm, I'm ready to move on. I, I, I'm willing to look at it from, from the standpoint, uh, totally, mm -hmm. but, for it to be really significant, somehow that seed has to get beyond the flood. Well, yeah, and we're going to get to that. But I need to share just a couple more verses, and then we'll get to that part. Because, again, unless you understand where the seed came from, it doesn't make sense as to even how and why they were preserved through the flood. Because, um, you know, like I said, the seed, the, the tares and the wheat, they would have continuance until the end of days. He says, allow both to grow together until the time of the end. So just uh, three more verses here, and then we'll move on to the, the whole thing as far as the, the flood. I, I want to revisit again 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, because this is Paul telling us that for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 
But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. But he said, so your mind, he didn't say, so your virginity will be taken, right? I'm just pointing it out. Just pointing it out. <laughs> yeah, but again, the serpent beguiling Eve, when you understand that story, that it was a sexual corruption, that's the only way a woman loses her church, her chaste virginity. And uh, there's several other passages we're going to go to okay. which confirm that. And this is also from the Apocrypha, that in the Maccabees, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, the, uh, the story of the mother of Eleazar, she tells, the, repeats the story that Paul is referencing here. She says, the mother of seven sons expressed also these principles to her children. I was a pure virgin and did not go outside my father's house, but I nar guarded the rib from which woman was made. No seducer corrupted me on a desert plain, nor did the destroyer, the deceitful serpent, defile the purity of my virginity. In the time of my maturity, I remained with my husband, and when these sons had grown up, their father died. And so she's referencing the story of the serpent beguiling Eve and causing her to lose her virginity and to bring forth the child Cain. Because again, in ancient times, this was common knowledge. All of the people during the early church knew this. And to give verification of that, I'll share another story from the Protoevangelion of James. And then we'll end with one other passage. On this account, this is from the Protoevangelium of James. It says, Now it was the sixth month with her, and behold, Joseph came from his building, and he entered into his house and found her great with child. And he smote his face and cast himself down upon the ground on sackcloth and wept bitterly, saying, With what countenance shall I look unto the Lord my God, and what prayer shall I make concerning the maiden? For I received her out of the temple of the Lord my God a virgin, and have not kept her safe. Who is it that hath ensnared me? Who hath done this evil in mine house, and hath defiled the virgin? Is not the story of Adam repeated in me? For as at the hour of his giving thanks, the serpent came and found Eve alone, and deceived her, so hath it befallen me also. So Joseph is telling you here that, you know, because he came home and found Mary well, big yeah. with child. And he's telling you that the same thing that happened to Adam has happened to her. And that even though he wasn't responsible for, you know, uh, that the serpent wasn't responsible for um, making Mary pregnant, that was the Holy Spirit. But he's telling you that the same thing happened to Adam. And that the serpent impregnated her with Cain. That that story is repeated here. He, he constantly deceived Eve, right? Over and over again at the river, at the cave. Um, <laughs> he eat this fruit, you shall, you shall not die. So Adam came there and she already been beguiled. And then so Adam, see, that's the thing. Did Adam take of the sin because he knew that what she had done? Or did he just disregard it, right? But I'm with you completely. Um, I understand where you're coming from. You make a good case. So I, I am listening well, again, to you, brother. In my opinion, it's undeniable. All these stories are telling you that the serpent beguiling Eve is what led to her impregnation with Cain. There's no other way to, uh, to understand these stories. Well, they were spiritual, they right? At that point? They haven't made flesh yet. That's the other thing, too, because I know no, that there were groups of they, angels. When they touched the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's when they were made physical. That's why she was able to be seduced by the serpent and impregnated with Cain. And then Adam eating the fruit also was his repeating the act with her, which led to the birth of Abel. That's why the Most High says in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, I'm going to put enmity between thy seed and her seed. 
because he's yeah, but see that. that that is a reference in my opinion to the coming of Yahushai. That's why a man didn't the second part, yeah, but the first part is in reference to Cain and Abel, thy seed and her seed. That is Cain and Abel, because he saw that she was already pregnant. Otherwise, why would he reference that? And where would the seed come from? She was already pregnant with Abel and Cain. And that's why he told her that you're going to give birth and, and bring forth children in sorrowful birth. That is true. And Because only the punishments make sense when you understand that she was already pregnant and those were prophecies. And that Adam then would have to work the soil in order to bring forth sustenance to feed their children. Uh, I mean, those are prophecies. Okay, one other thing, and then we'll, because this will nail it down completely. It's undeniable. This is from the Gospel of Philip. It says, He who has been created as beautiful, but you would not find his son's noble creations. If he were not created, but begotten, you would find that his seed was noble. But now he was created and he begot. What nobility is this? First, adultery came into being, afterward, murder, and he was begotten in adultery, for he was the child of the serpent. And so he became a murderer, just like his father, and he killed his brother. All right, so let me explain this passage, because when you understand this passage, is, again, it's undeniable that the serpent is the father of Cain. He who has been created is beautiful. We know that Lucifer was a created angel. And being a created angel, he was never supposed to copulate with the daughters of humanity. He was not a flesh being. And so copulating with a flesh woman, his children were not noble because he was never supposed to beget children. And so that's what the next verses are telling us. It says, but you would not find his son's noble creations. If he were not created, meaning if he were not an angel, but he were begotten just like Adam, that he was human and flesh and blood, you would find his seed was noble. But now he was created, meaning that he was an angel and he begot, meaning that he had children. What nobility is this? And then it tells you specifically, first, adultery came into being. That adultery was his seduction of Eve. It was his seducing Eve in adultery that led to what afterward murder. What was that murder? It was his son, Cain, killing Abel, the firstborn son of Adam. And so... And he was begotten in adultery, for he was the child of the serpent. And so he became a murderer, just like his father, and he killed his brother. I mean, you can't make sense of this passage unless you understand that the serpent beguiled Eve and that Cain was his physical progeny and that adultery came into being first and then murder. It's undeniable. I mean, you can't make sense of it otherwise. And when you put all of these verses together, you study all of this in great context, then you understand why Christ said to them, you know, talking in uh, Luke and also Matthew, he says, wherefore you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets, Fill ye up the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. Remember, Cain and his children have seraphic appearance because they are born of the serpent. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, 
whom you slew between the temple and the altar. So there he's tying the Pharisees to Cain, who was the murderer of Abel. And the murderer of John's also, dad, right? And exactly, Zacharias, mm -hmm. uh, the high priest. So again, that tells you that they are of Cain. But they were Jews, that, right? They were Pharisees. Yes, they were Pharisees. They had usurped uh, the kingdom. So they yes. looked the same as Yahweh Shai, Jesus, except their deeds were wicked. They were killers, murderers. Well, they were that particular tribe in Joshua that said they were from a faraway country in Joshua chapter 10, and they acted like they were they from afar. Them. They tricked them, exactly, yeah. and they were spared. And then they were made servants unto the Levitical priesthood. And then mm -hmm. they usurped the Levite priesthood, and they became the Pharisees. And so they were, you know, they were like the Edomites and Esau. They were of the seed of the serpent. And that's why he's telling them that, you know, I know you are Abraham's seed, but you are, um, you are of your father, the devil. Wasn't that and, why he called them gods too? Because a lot of people take that verse out of context. And I think that verse completely fits into what you're saying. Oh yeah, with with regard to pre-existence, yeah. Because they're fallen angels in flesh, right? Exactly. Ye are angels in flesh, yes. And because people really misquote that one. Go ahead, Jason. I'm sorry, I keep cutting you off. No, I'm I, I'm with you, Zen. You're you're making a great case. Uh, I can see, I can see the serpent seed. Now I just need to see how it got past the flood. Well, yeah. Now we're ready to go there. So let me pull up a chapter. Yes. It's a great study. I, like I'm finding it very informative, and for me, the pre uh, predestination thing kind of ties into what Zen's saying. It's just hard for me as a physical human to wrap my interpretation around that because I, I want everyone to come to repentance. And so when I see a brick in the wall, like that was preordained to be evil, it's for me like it's, ah, I want to take that brick out, right? And I don't think I can. Well, here. still, Christ, when he died on the cross, he extended grace and salvation. To Unto both bloodlines. You're and right. So okay. It, it doesn't matter whether you're born of the serpent seed or, you know, of Adam's seed. What now is whether you accept Christ as Savior Messiah, and um, you know, accept Him as as the way, the truth, and the light, and the way to salvation. Yeah, I don't know how, I don't know how Dean O'Dell could could hold any accusation against you Zen, because that right there what you just said is that is witnessing under the angel's word that's the word of yahweh that's go ahead jason no this is great um ronnie and i are always looking for the truth and uh why well, it's just so hard to get somebody to engage in a conversation we just recently uh, had flat earth falker come on and um you know, we had a, a great conversation with him. We differ, and you know, he's sort of tied up with a different team. But we're trying to trying to cross the barriers. The one thing Ronnie and I just can't do is ever bend on truth. And um, so, as long as we're all about you know truth research and it's verifiable, documentable, and we can all come to an agreement on it, that's the most exciting thing we can do. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I agree. And I have no problem. Actually, I, I welcome being able to go chapter by chapter, verse by verse over the scriptures. Cause, and I think it's important to have discourse and dialogue uh, and to share conversation because otherwise, how do you come to the truth? How do you have your questions answered? And how do you, you know, know better in discernment unless you do those kind of things? But like uh, Dean, he will not meet me in debate or go with me onto a show to go through it chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Um, for whatever reason, Nathan Roberts also refuses to do the same thing. And if you have a disagreement with me on any of the things that I teach, I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, it just, you know, because everything I teach is based upon numerous, numerous dozens and sometimes hundreds of verses and chapters and scriptures from many different ancient sources. But the foundation of the Bible is where my faith resides. And then everything else is built upon that. And so my uh, 
you know, I don't have opinions. I just bring forth in Revelation mm -hmm. what the ancient sources themselves say. And so with regard to the, as far as, you know, the flood of Noah's day and how it was that uh, the serpent seed made it through. Remember again that Matthew chapter 13, Christ said, allow both to grow together till the time of the end. And that at the end, he would send his angels uh, forth as reapers to gather the wheat for preservation and the tares for burning. And it's not just, it, it, it's not just a physical and not just a spiritual, but it's a both that even though you're born like some of these Illuminati defectors that come out of their families and put their lives at risk in order to tell us and warn us of what the New World Order elites are doing. Uh, many people have been disappeared doing exactly that. You know, John Todd, Arizona Wilder, Savali, different individuals, Carolyn Hamlet. Um, and then there are, you know, those that born of uh, Adam seed that go the way of Cain. And so they give up their parts in the, the books of life. And so when it tells us that uh, Ham saw the nakedness of his father, that when you understand what that passage is referencing, it is actually alluding to him having sexual relations with the wife of Noah. And that when you study many other text in other different passages, you learn that Ham is the father of Canaan, and that Canaan was the result of that particular, that fornication. And a lot of people, they interpret that story of Ham seeing the nakedness of his father as him having homosexual relations with Noah, but that's not true. And the reason being is because Canaan was the result of that fornication. And so it had to have come that, you know, a child was born of a woman. And so when you look at Leviticus chapter 18, verse 8, and other passages there, it tells you that to see the nakedness of the father is to have sexual relations with the mother. In this case, um, the mother was Nama. Uh, and you can get clarity on that from other sources. And I'll share that with you. That Nama, that Noah had three wives, that he had a wife that um, he, both Shem and Japheth were born from. And then he was instructed by the Most High God to take Nama, the sister of Tubal Cain, as wife in order to preserve the serpent seed through the flood. And specifically, this is what he did. And then Nama passed away and he took another wife and her name was Akila, I believe. But I'll read and get, get you familiar with these particular passages. So, let me go to the verses. All right, here from the writings of Abraham. Oh, and also I can tell you how Og survived because the, the giants were also spared and allowed to have continuance after the flood. And that's who we have um, all of the other giants coming from Goliath and his brothers. But it says this, and the child grew and waxed strong in wisdom and mighty in the power of the priesthood, for he was initiated into the order of the ancients in his childhood and learned the rites and ordinances and the powers of the priesthood with the signs and tokens and key words where he could call upon the powers of heaven to com combat the forces of the adversary. And when he was come of age, he took wives and begat many sons and daughters who grew up in righteousness and served the Lord all their days, and some died, and others were caught up into the city of Enoch. But in the next generation they corrupted themselves, for the daughters of Noah's sons did go forth and lay with the sons of men, which thing was an abomination. 
in the eyes of God. Wherefore the Lord said unto Noah, Behold, the daughters of thy sons have sold themselves. For behold, mine anger is kindled against the sons of men, for they will not hearken to my voice. Wherefore all those who go in unto them will be destroyed with them. And Noah was 450 years old. He begat a son, he called his name Japheth. 42 years later, he begat another son of her, who was the mother of Japheth, and he called his name Shem. Eight years later, Noah begat a son of his wife, Nama, who was of the seed of Cain, and he called his name Ham. For he said, through him will the curse be preserved in the land. Now Noah had taken a wife of the seed of Cain, and she was a righteous woman nevertheless. The curse remained with her seed according to the word of God. And Noah took her on this wise, for the word of the Lord came unto Noah, saying, Take unto thyself Nama, the daughter of Lamech, who dwelleth here in the city of thy father, for she hath been faithful to my gospel, wherefore I shall preserve through her the seed of Cain through the flood. This Lamech, who was the father of Nama, was of the seed of Cain, being the son of Methuselah, the son of Mehujael, the son of Ira, the son of Enoch, the son of Cain. Uh, I'm going to skip down a little. I, I, in my book, in the great contest, the enmity between the seed lines, uh, chapter 19, it goes into great detail on all of this. And it's a very long chapter, but I'm just going to give you the essentials here. While Nama was yet a child, great consternation fell upon the seed of Cain, for Ired, the son of Enoch, the son of Cain, had become a member of the secret combination and was privy to all its secrets until one night when the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Ired, thou hast done evil instead of good and hast followed after Satan rather than God. Wherefore, I shall destroy thee and thine house when I send in the flood upon the earth. But Ired was pricked in his heart and pled with the Lord to show mercy and to pervert, preserve his seed through the great flood. Seeing that his penitence was true, the Lord said to him, Ired, if thou repent and reveal the evils of the secret combination unto the sons of Seth, I will have mercy upon thee and I will join thy seed unto the seed of Seth that it may be preserved through the great flood. Wherefore Ired went forth and began to reveal the secrets to the sons of Cain unto the sons of Seth. Lamech being master Mahan at that time, Fired found Ired sitting in the garden with Joram, the young son of Ired, and slew him. Thus Lamech slew Ired for. Um, for he revealed it unto his mother Zillah and she unto his sister Ada, wherefore Ada and Zillah confronted Lamech with his evil and cursed him in the name of the Lord for having slain Irid, who had repented of his wickedness from among the sons of men. Uh, skipping down again. Thus did Nama come to dwell among the sons of Adam, and she grew up before the Lord in righteousness and was known for her tender care toward the sick and the unfortunate. Nevertheless, she had not husband because she was of the forbidden race. When the word of the Lord came unto Noah, saying, Take unto thyself Nama, the daughter of Lamech, who dwelleth here in the city of thy father, she hath been faithful to my gospel. Wherefore, I shall preserve through her the seed of Cain through the flood. Noah went unto his father Methuselah. Methuselah inquired of the Lord and returned his word unto his son Lamech. Verily, thus saith the Lord. Mine handmaiden Nama have I given unto thy son Noah, that the seed of Cain might be preserved through the great flood which I will send upon the earth. Wherefore, let not thy, my son Noah fear to take her to wife, for in so doing he shall be blessed, for through him will come all nations. Wherefore, say unto him, Noah, my son, I have looked upon the evils of the sons of men, which have come up before me, for they have corrupted the whole earth save only this city in which thou dwellest. Therefore I will send in the floods upon the earth, but thou and thy seed will I preserve through the floods, for I will send mine angels to instruct thee in the building of an ark, wherein ye shall be saved. Behold, I shall establish thy seed before me forever, and I will spread them abroad over the earth as numerous as the sand 
upon the seashore. Thy seed shall not cease as long as the earth shall stand, but through thee and thy priesthood, which will be preserved in thy seed, shall all nations be blessed. And when Lamech returned this word to his son Noah, he rejoiced and praised the Lord, saying, I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, for thou hast been unto me a strong wall against all that would seek my destruction. Yea, thou hast promised to shelter me from the disasters which are coming upon the earth, that the flood shall not come in upon me to destroy my seed from the earth. Thou hast set my foot upon a rock that the sons of men shall not prevail against me. Yea, I will walk in the way of the ancients. In the paths which thou hast appointed will I spend my days, for thou art my shield and my deliverer, and in thee will I trust all the days of my life. Amen. Last portion. Thus did Noah take to wife Nama, the daughter of Zillah, the wife of Lamech, of the seed of Cain, and she bare him a son, whom he named Ham. And thus was the curse preserved in the land through the great flood. For when the patience of God was ended, in which he did grant a space of time for repentance unto the sons of men, the floods came in upon the earth and destroyed all flesh from off the face of the earth, save eight souls only. For Noah and his youngest wife, Ada, and his three sons, Shem, Japheth, and Ham, and one each of their wives were preserved in the ark, which the angels had instructed Noah in building. The remainder of the righteous had died or been caught up into Enoch city prior to the time of the flood, and these eight were saved. And so you see, even in this story, that Nama had passed away before uh, the ark was built, and that, um, you know, uh, that he had another wife named Ada, his third wife. And so, anyways, that is specific on how the seed of the serpent survived the flood. And so that that is um, really well clarified. So then what we understand is um that the nephilim were also disembodied spirits that torment mankind as well plus the seed from ham the cursed ones and then down through the lines up until the scribes and pharisees that same bloodline that the, went back through ham back to yeah, cain the canaanites okay yeah, yep. all the way that, to cain yes that all really does work um that matches with what i can uh like you did a great job brother uh thank you yeah good job son appreciate it yeah it's a very uh you know i've been studying the bloodline issue for a very long time and so <laughs> um understanding that i you know it makes sense to me why it was that the apostles the patriarchs and the prophets spent so much time on the genealogy and, you know, because most people not understanding this teaching, they just completely skip over all that. All that is meaningless to them. But yet in the biblical narrative, all throughout the history uh, from the Eden to Armageddon, it's a war of these two bloodlines, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And that the genealogies are very important because they tell us who was of the seed of the serpent and who was of the line of Adam. And that these two bloodlines, as I said, even now we see that the bloodline elites, that they are all from the same family. They're all connected, you know, to one particular, um, you know, Charlemagne and Vlad the Impaler and all these different things. It's the same thing that they are the seed of Cain. They even tell us in their own, I guess we can finish with one other quote that, um, that where the elites themselves tell us that they are the children of the devil. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what I'm talking about, but there's a, a passage and I'll share it with you and this will kind of sum up the entire show and bring it to fullness as far as the you know what we are dealing with now contemporarily 
it says his benefactor test subject believe that while most of the sons of Adam had double strand DNA, he had been told by his family that he and his blood relatives were distinctly different and that he, like his fathers before him, had triple strand DNA. He wanted my friend to secretly prove once and for all if this was true or not. The subject claimed that his extended family and their cousins who are kings, queens, princesses and princesses, as well as leaders of industry and banking worldwide. They believe they are children of an otherworldly race of humanoid beings. He'd been taught by his tutors that once upon a time, his ancestors had fallen to earth after some cosmic calamity in the time before the garden. He believed that while their ancestral mother was Eve, their ancestral father was not Adam. He was torn to know if a child of Cain was actually genetically different and whether he could be saved. He thought of the Vatican's pronouncement that the aliens are our cousins and the Vishnu teachings of a time when gods flew in spaceships and destroyed whole cities in a single blast. He even had notes about Elijah being caught up in a chariot of fire. Maybe he had misread or misunderstood the entire history of his Bible. Maybe from Genesis to Revelation, it was about some far more tangible and real fallen angel alien cousins than the ghost-like destroying angels he'd always pictured in his imagination. It only matters what they believe because our original subject and his relatives who are the kings, queens, princesses and princesses as well as leaders of industry. They believe they are our humanoid cousins, superior hybrids, half alien and only half human. They once reigned from Olympus and were pharaohs. Whatever the real truth of their history, their belief is the driver of their actions. Being the true believers they are, they will continue to operate in accordance with their belief and the laws of alien Darwinian type survival. That's why they interbreed to maintain the purity of their bloodline. That's why they secretly meet and connive to pass power down between themselves. And that's why they must fool the rest of mankind into wars of self-destruction and debt so that we may be forever enslaved to their lusts on this prison planet till death do us part. More than afraid, they know in their hearts that this is a fight for survival. The, and it had begun just as my friend had said, as a murder investigation, starting with the first murder when that Luciferian demon dad had first whispered of the evil deed to his willing child, Cain. It continued down through time, the sons of Adam fighting for survival and destroying the alien giants in Canaan land, David and the hybrid Goliath and his four hybrid brothers, and all the hidden true believers since, hiding in plain sight, so powerful, so important, yet so, so afraid. These earthbound half cousins of ours continue to laugh, but it is a nervous laugh at that as they have a joke or two at our expense, recreating their lying father's fall to earth and flashing their heretofore secret gang hand signs to each other right in front of our faces. I know now how dangerous their beliefs are because they are being driven by their beliefs, taught to them by their real alleged father, the father of lies. And even now he knows the truth and whispers into his initiate's ears, just as he did in Cain's ear. The sons of Adam, as long as they live, they are dangerous. And that was a, a post about the, the two bloodlines that was on Steve Quells. It's a, um, 
called an investigation, Life is a Box of Chocolates. It tells the story of this particular geneticist being hired by one of these bloodline elites to study if their DNA was different. And this guy was murdered and also the uh, Illuminati elite guy. And I think it was um, Douglas DeVere, I mean, Nicholas DeVere, which he, you know, he was killed and he was releasing in a book called The Dragon Legacy, how they were of the children of Cain. But anyways, um, he being murdered, this other individual named Danny Moreo, I believe his name is, I'm not positive anymore, but um, he received, he's also a geneticist and he received all of this information uh, in you know the investigation. Um, he acquired, inherited all of this and learned in studying and examining what his friend was into that he wrote this whole thing up and uh, I just read portions of it. But if you want to read the whole thing, you can um, look up Life as a Box of Chocolates. It's a very in-depth and incredible story. I also release the entire story of it in my book, Skyfall, Angels of Destiny, and talking about... The it's a Mandela of- effect. I don't believe that uh, Life was like a Box of Chocolates was in, in the movie. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know about that. Do you know, uh, are you not a Mandela effect guy? Uh, I haven't studied it in great detail. It's not, you know, it's not. My focus is on the ancient scriptures, and that's what I. Or they haven't been changing yet. The ancient yeah. ones, they seem to be pretty good. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, uh, just thought I'd share that. It is an interesting story, though. Yeah, well written. I makes sense. Like, what do you think, Jay? <clears throat> well. Since Zen, I I think he's probably right with what he's been explaining here. It, it does make sense. Of of course, I want to check it out more. But since you came came to this understanding, the longest of all of us, could you share with us how this understanding has benefited you? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, it is the skeleton key for unlocking all of scripture including even the king james because even though this knowledge has been lost and it is no longer majority opinion this was common knowledge during the ancient times and so in the first centuries you know leading up to the third century uh, when they began to canonize canonize and create an authorized bible before then the everybody read and studied everything And this knowledge, as I said, was commonplace. And that's why you see even in the Talmud and the Kabbalah and the legends of the Jews, the traditions of the Jews, um, that they write about it as truth. Because, again, it is truth. And it's even encoded into the King James. When you read and study, even like what I talked about in 2 Corinthians, 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, uh, Matthew chapter 13, it all becomes clear that Cain was a child of the wicked one. And only, only by understanding it that way can you make sense of the punishments that occurred after Adam and Eve ate fruit from the tree of the knowledge, good and evil. Because why otherwise would, you know, hiding their genitals, would God say to the serpent, you know, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. And how did the serpent end up having seed anyways? It was because he beguiled Eve and impregnated her with Cain. And so God is prophesying there that the enmity between the seed and serpent and the seed of the woman would begin with Cain and Abel and Cain would murder Abel. And that's what Christ would allude to later And when the Pharisees came against him and conspired his murder, he connects them to being the murderers of the prophets from Cain to Zacharias. Um, Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, all of these things become clear when you understand this in fullness. And I understand that is a very difficult concept for people to open up themselves to the possibility of. But when you do, in my opinion, it will bless you in so many ways to be able to understand the fullness of the scriptures in the way that God intended them 
too, because even now we are contending against this bloodline and that this war, the New World Order elites against humanity and the children of Adam, that it rages on and it will continue until the harvest at the end of days with the coming, the second advent of Christ. But the good news is that no matter what bloodline you were born into, that you can have salvation through Christ as long as you accept him and come to know him as Savior mm -hmm. Messiah and that you understand that uh, your deliverance uh, has been paid for, that he paid the price on the cross and that defeating death, he shows to us that he is the authority and he holds the keys to life and death. Mm -hmm. Hey, have you been paying attention to this whole March 22nd thing coming up? No, what is that? You want me to give the update? Do you guys want to finish off anything before I go through a couple of updates? Yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, well, I um, I just wanted to say, Zen, um, we, you know, we're straight shooters here. And uh, what you did tonight with the scriptures, I appreciate. And um, But there's a couple things. With, with you being associated with Truth Frequency Radio and stuff like that, what I want to do is I want to offer an invitation to you where Ronnie and I would absolutely support you. We would send people your direction if we could be confident that you wouldn't, you know, be spreading any lies or disinformation. And you're, you're showing yourself to be a good researcher. Um, you know, the AE map and model, that would be, that would be a big thing if, if you could get over something like that, we would love to be able to promote you more. But uh, right now we hold back because of, you know, certain issues like that. Well, those are issues for you. They're not issues for me. And yeah. if you want to sometime talk about the AE model, I have no problems with it. Because in my opinion, the whole thing with the Pac-Man model, uh, it's ludicrous. I mean, I don't understand how you think the sun goes straight across and then somehow pops out on the other side when it's clear in scripture that it tells us that the sun circles and that even with the midnight sun phenomena, it shows that the sun is circling in the skies. It's undeniable. Even with well, the, you have any, the dark trails. It's, it's very deniable. Yeah, we don't have any evidence of any anyone with a compass filming the sun travel from west to east. It's never been documented ever and the few the few clips that we do have we can show you really easily that it's cgi but we could do that for a whole other time um you well, know yeah if you guys want to talk about that i'd be glad to do a show on it yeah cool. i think the next one we should set that up it'd be great um we don't we don't call it the pac-man that was like uh Darwinism, uh mind control and he tried to you know ruin the it's basically the sun and the moon and the stars rise and set around your your personal circle of sight. We we don't believe that we live in a physical atom atomistic world. Like atoms don't really exist. No one's ever here's an atom or a photon. It's never been never been observed. So you know we we stick to just straight truth, and, and we'll have to go through all of that. Um, I think we'll set that up. That'll be great. And we just bring the observable evidence and i do understand where you're coming from with the book of enoch but we can show you again i know i've showed you before basically the circle of sight and the gates are actually pointing to your perspective the horizon line is is where the gates are the six different areas where the sun rises and sets and all the stars and the sun and the moon but we can that'll be a totally other time um so they added an extra month i think you know the hebrews that left in 70 a.d sort of changed the calendar and i know you're you're an expert on the calendars as well. I'm, I'm no expert. I'm well, <laughs> you're well read. You're well read on the calendars. I've followed a lot of your teachings for years on that as well. But supposedly this year, um, Purim, which is March 20 to 23rd, uh, is um, also, uh, what is it, the equinox. And so we're having all these things line up. So there's been people that have been watching. I'm just going to play this clip here real yeah, quick. Yeah, well, it's the 21st is the last day of winter. You know, the 22nd. First day of spring, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then. Before uh, the Sabbath. Then the Sabbath is, is the next day, the 23rd. And so all these things are lining up. You know, we're in the 70th year of Israel. And um, yeah, just it's interesting stuff. All right, sure, yeah. 
Be glad mission of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the ultimate completion with the Bride of Christ, being with one at, at last united with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And at the time of the rapture, we will all be united as one. And yes, some of you say we're we're united now. Yes, we are, but we are still on the earth, a place that's run by the spirit of the Antichrist. This is not the ultimate oneness <laughs> that I'm looking for. I'm sorry that you think it's the same, but it's going to be better than you think. So, uh... I wanted also to mention a few other things that Sister wrote in and pointed out that are very interesting as well. And also, just to recap a little bit, you know, you've got the 21st, again, a major th thing hitting on the 21st, but get this, on the, not only is it, it's Purim in Israel, okay? But on the Torah calendar, it is also Passover, which I find very interesting. They are overlapping. You might say, well, which calendar will God use? Perhaps all of them at the same time. <laughs> so what she's just pointing out is, is you know, that the Passover, uh, the festival of Purim, the fulfillment of, of all of the feasts and, and everything that's been prophesied, you know, I don't know about you, Zen, but uh, the Holy Spirit is, it does get removed, right? Um, are you a pre post? Do you believe that we'll be caught up to the sky? What are your thoughts? Yeah, on the last day before the wrath of God is poured out on the wicked. So, those seven terrible days you're, you're speaking of, those could start when? Uh, after the Antichrist is revealed. So, let's say they announce on Purim. Um, that the Antichrist is revealed. Another weird thing that I'm seeing, um, Jews and Muslims are actually coming together now in Europe um, to fight. So because apparently kosher meat and halal meat has been outlawed. So I've seen a big push for the third temple and the Mashiach. What do you know about, the, have you been studying the Mashiach at all? The... What do you mean? Like the, the, um, the Antichrist. The body? Yeah, I think that's another name for it. Yeah. The, they're saying that uh, he's here, he's going to be announced. It could be this new military guy that's running for prime minister. It could also be Netanyahu. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be what we think. But all of this seems to be culminating together with the, the Noahide laws, where if you blaspheme, right. right, you know about all that. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah, the beheadings and all that. Yeah, and the, remember the gray state? by david uh, crowley he put out that video it showed the masons with the he had they had the which mccall the guillotines no i haven't seen that but uh check it out gray state <laughs> yeah he's he's that supposedly he was killed the the guy who uh, made the video gray state yeah, it was just a little bit of a prophecy but you know one other thing that we we share with people that uh i guess dean odell took from us this is a guy that was a part of our team he's uh He's taken a step back. He still watches, and, you know, I, I believe he believes in Yahawashai still to this day. His name was Mikal from Flatter Photography, and this is kind of an AE map and, and also a physical reality killer. Like, even Dean, I'm going to share this quick. Hey, we've even caught pictures of this. Uh, so there's clouds behind the sun. Coming back from Birmingham one day, and we, we've witnessed this. There's the verse, Job 37, 21. And now men see not the bright light, which is a reference to the sun, which is in the clouds but the wind passes and cleanses. So, so, you know, the scriptures do state that the sun is within the clouds. It's within our circle of sight. Everything is local, the moon, the stars, the sun, and, um, you know, they circle around us. Yes. They don't, um, the, the straight thing that you were talking about with the sun, it's, it rises due east and sets due west everywhere on earth. And it, it doesn't really work on any physical type of a construct, but that's a whole other topic. <laughs> Um, yeah, when the equinox coming up March 22nd, we can all verify, or 21st, we can all verify that the sun is going to rise 90 degrees due east, set 270 de degrees west, everywhere, every single latitude, every single longitude, everywhere. 
And uh, so there is, it's verifiable. And that right there shows how the AE mapping model doesn't work. Yeah, I would disagree with you on that, but yeah, we we'll have to go through it another time. Yeah, we got to put the line upon line, scripture upon scripture with everything. But overall, I think it was a really fun night. And uh, see how easy this was, Dean? You know, I hope somebody shares this with Dean because, you know, we're not out here to attack anybody. Um, me and Zen, we, we had differing opinions. And, and now I believe I stand on a, a higher clarity of truth. And, you know, brother Zen, um, I've seen you been you have been persecuted for stepping outside of the normal and pushing the boundaries for the word of the creator. And, you know, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for Jason. I'm thankful for everybody in the chat tonight that we had a, you know, civil discourse. Everybody was enjoying the conversation. This is what real true men do. The righteous men should always meet. And um, whether or not we disagree on everything, you know, the end goal is that we try to procure fruit that is researched and wisdom and knowledge. And, and that's what really my goal was here tonight. Amen. And, you know, as you said earlier, this, these things that we're talking about are not salvational issues, you know, so um, we shouldn't have hatred and condemnation in such manner that we can't even talk to each other and that we're going to vilify and, and, you know, lay accusation and not even come together in dialogue. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's what children do. And so, yeah, I'm honored to be able to come together with you guys and and share um, and to study it out and to uh, lay it all out scripture by scripture and chapter by chapter. And yeah, I think that's the way that m most people should be able to do, but it's it's very rare, even in the Christian community, which is sad, but true. All right. Well, I look forward to talking to you again, Zen. And um, yeah, next time let's dedicate... Uh, to the scriptures and flat earth and sounds good. yeah sounds good and the problems that we have with that ae map but yeah, uh, absolutely i'd love to that'd be great cool and so yeah the last update is um i think we're going to be live on the awake souls channel on wednesday i'll probably put out a trailer if, if that's the case right um you're strike free yeah and the 12th my uh strike's supposed to be over so wednesday um we'll probably we'll live stream from my channel and uh, there's going to be a big upgrade that ronnie's been working on that's real exciting um i also want to just throw out there real quick that uh logan paul has announced when his um big flat earth movie is going to be released and that yeah, comes cool. in that comes in at march 20th uh, so that falls right into this. Uh, things could really be <laughs> happening around this March 22nd time period, because uh, if if anybody's, you know, thought that the behind the curve documentary was was bad for flat Earth, um, <laughs> <laughs> Logan Paul is, is probably going to just blow it sky high, right? Awesome, awesome, well, good deal. <laughs> Uh, and just so you guys know, um, it's my opinion that Passover this year will be on the, the 18th of uh, April uh, because okay. we do have a 13th month Adar too. And that's only because, um, you know, the full moon Sabbath occurs on the vernal equinox and the day after the new moon. Well, the full moon is on the 21st. And oh, yeah. The second yep. Sabbath. And then, mm -hmm. you know, the, the full moon is always, always aligned with Passover. And so the 16th is always the day after the full moon. And the barley will not be ready to be waved uh, on the but, day of first. But didn't you, how should I say, look at under the fields? They're all ready to go. They're all white, ready to go. Yeah. So what, what happens if all of a sudden they are ready? Well, that'd be crazy, right? What Zen well, believes in the seven days of of tribulation so to speak right what do you mean seven days of tribulation? the great the seven great days uh i i think it's different again in some stories it is seven days of tribulation and some it says it's the you know one day the great and terrible day of the lord and so i keep into consideration uh all the different stories like mm -hmm. if you read the the um the apocalypse of thomas it describes the 
you know, the great and terrible day of the Lord as being a full week. And so there are different stories and different narratives. Yeah, we got to read that book. We're going to write that one down. I'm going to take a note on that, The Apocalypse of Thomas. But I guess... Uh, um, I was just going to say really quickly, if you want all of the end time narratives, we compile them in a book called The Great Commission to The mm -hmm. End Time Apocalypses. And there are so many... Uh, books that most people have never heard about never read that are yeah we've awesome. been reading the books off your site actually brother okay right on well yeah well, yeah, yeah we share the links too with the the chats always excellent well we appreciate you guys and that that book will bless anybody that's interested in the end times and the fig tree generation so so people can find you at sacredwordpublishing.com right yes. um as well as you have two other places right you're live to air on yeah, I'm on Truth Frequency Radio every Thursday night, the show called Secrets of Eels, 9 to 11 p.m., and then on Revolution Radio every Wednesday, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern. And then we do a Saturday Targum study um, every Saturday on our Discord channel. People can find that on my Facebook page. And then we do a uh, every other Friday with my daughter-in-law ask me anything show and we answer everybody's questions. So That's awesome. We're going to leave the links as, as well for your channels below. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I can just pray that everybody here is lifted up and blessed with the Holy spirit of the creator. Amen. And, uh, yeah. We just give thanks for tonight. Yeah. And thank you guys. And yeah, I look forward to the, uh, the flat earth discussion yeah, cool. it'll be it'll be good we'll do it next time all right so where did you hear this only beyond flat earth